and welcome you to our talk about the TPM software stack. Um, we try to enable the TPM support or ecosystem on the Linux. Um, let's see what, what, so we are more covering the user space side, not only the kernel side. Um, what we will be talking about today is a little bit of, about the background. I think we can skip most of this. The design and the architecture of the TSS, the open source implementation, how we get, did get this to a successful open source project. And at the end, we will show some TP, TP, TSS2 use cases and examples how we can actually use the TSS. Who are we? My name is Peter Hüve. Um, nobody can pronounce that name, even Germans, so don't worry about this. Uh, I, at daytime, I work at Infineon, one of the major TPM uh, vendors, um, as a senior staff engineer, so I'm developing firmware that runs on the TPM. Um, I used to be TPM subsystem maintainer until Chaco took, all, all, took over all the work, so thank you for that, Chaco. <laughs> so uh, that's why they retired this year, and I'm a contributor to the TPM software stack as well. Hi, I'm Joshua Locke, I work in Intel's Open Source Technology Center. Um, been working on TPM software stack for about six months, and before that I was a long time Yocto project contributor. Yeah, and our main presenter is missing today, uh, which is more or less Philip Tricker. He gave the same talk about the TSS software stack at the Linux Summit North America, but in order to present you the same content, um, we more or less stole his slides and put it into a new format to present it to you, maybe in a different format. <laughs> Yeah, so thanks a lot to Phil for, for putting all, uh, together the slide content. So if there are any errors, it's his, his mistake. If there, are, no, just, if there are any errors, it's my mistake. And for, if, 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 there, if the slides are good, it's of course Phil's uh, contribution there. So thanks a lot. So who here knows the TPM? Who has used the TPM? Uh, I think after the previous talk of Chaco, uh, the most stuff was already covered. Um, a few things I definitely want to say still um, if you want to get uh, uh, more information about the TPM and how to use it and how it works and all this stuff, I would definitely not recommend reading the TPM library spec as your first thing to do. That's a 3,000 pages thing with additional specs and additional specs and additional specs and eratas. So I would not really recommend it as a beginner's lecture. Um, Ariel has put up some really nice training materials. He has also wrote, wrote, written some nice book. Um, also, something I really want to mention is the guys at Google did put up a TPM, JSON, a TPM JavaScript implementation, um, which is not on this machine. <laughs> I would have wanted to show it, show it to you. Um, where they explain in an interactive tutorial how the TPM is made up, what, what uh, the different components of a TPM are, how we can use that and all this stuff. So it's a really cool explanation thing uh, that they put up on their website there. It's on GitHub, so you can even look at the source code there. And the funny thing is they are actually using our TPM software stack here. And that's all web-based, so you can just interact with it all through your browser and you don't have to install a stack or have a TPM or anything to start exploring it. Yeah, so it's really, really pretty cool, so a big shout out to, Google, to the Google guys there. So if we are always talking about the TPM2 software stack, I just want to make clear what we are talking about here. Um, it's the TPM2 software, TSS2, which means TPM2 software stack, um, as defined by the TCG. That's a lot of words for a s simple TSS stack um, that's conforming to the TCG, TCG specifications. There are other uh, 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 stacks out there who, which might be conformant to the, to the TCG spec or might not be conformant to the TCG stack. They all have their purpose, they all have their use cases. They are all good. Let the users decide what is the best. Um, we present here the TCG one or the TCG compliant one as a, an open source implementation done by a lot of companies which we will talk about later. So how is this uh, design coming up? Um, as I already said, um, the, the TSS is based on the TCG specifications. So there is a big specification on how to write the TSS that's compliant to the TCG specifications. As the, in, inside of the T, uh, TCG, the Trusted Computing Group, there are so-called work groups, one work group exclusively, uh, exclusively working on the TSS design and the specification. And in order to come up with a good implementation of an, or with a good design of an API, you of course have to implement an API to see whether it's actually fitting to your use cases. And this is how this uh, um, project came about, was more or less a reference implementation that was developed along with the specification by the TCG. So we could try out things 
in code and see whether it worked out or not. If they worked out, we could put it into the specification and vice versa. This has advantages and this also has disadvantages. If you have something you want to fundamentally change in, 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 in your design, you have to change spec. So you cannot just simply develop in the void and say, hey, this is cool. You rather have to convince the other guys of the TCG that your idea is really cool and change the spec and spec changes are always uh, not so fun. So <laughs> the design goal of the TSS by the TCG is definitely a layered design which provides a lot of abstraction. Of course, abstraction also means a little bit of co complexity, um, but yeah. So, so it's mod uh, modelized that you have your transport layer completely different from your, separate from your APIs. So depending on, on how you use the, the, the APIs, you don't really see whether you are talking to a device, talking to a simulator, talking to the TBS on Windows. Um, you have a lot of flexibility there. It also allows you both programming models. You can have synchronous calls or asynchronous calls. So you can do even event-driven uh, programming. And it's also designed that way that a distro, the TCG, or your vendor can impose some sane defaults. But if you are an expert on TPM and know every detail and want to change something, you can easily change details. So, so it, it gives you a fine-grained control about how the TSS works. Also, as with every good API or software stack, it's layered. So we really have a lower layer, which is more or less for people who are uh, really into pain, <laughs> uh, because it's more or less a one-to-one -on -one mapping of TPM commands to a C API. Um, but you can use it on any kind of uh, uh, environment. So if you have a really constrained environment, you only need, need a libc and you can talk to the TPM if you want to. And on top of that, we add more and more layers um, to make it more and more easy for the, for, for, for the users to write their applications. But of course, the more, comf the, com the more comfort you get, the more dependencies you pull into your system. So f for the upper layers, you, for example, need to have a crypto library installed on your system, which might be hard on, some, on, on certain microcontrollers. This is the architecture design as defined by the TCG. It's more or less a simply rip off or out of the spec. Um, Credits again to Philip Tricker for pulling it out of the spec. So I did not even have to look it up into the spec, which is great. Um, but it shows a little bit how the, the, the whole design is layered. At the, at the bottom, we see the TPM device driver, which is not standardized by the TCG. So we, we can do there whatever we want. It can be anything. It can be a simulator. It can be uh, the dev TPM zero. It can be the TPM. TBS under Windows, or it can be something completely different. It's not really standardized there. On top of that, we have the TPM access broker and resource manager. That part is more or less standardized by the TCG. And it gives some flexibility around the limitations the TPM has. The TPM is a really const uh, resource constrained system. You have so and so many key slots. And if you want to have more than these key slot, uh, key, keys available, somebody has to pull the key out, secure it, storely, uh, store it securely, put in the new key in, and handle all that stuff for you. That is part of the access broker and resource manager. It currently lives partially in the kernel, and you can have, if you want, also a user space uh, resource manager, which we will cover later. Then, as I already mentioned, the transport layer is separated from everything else. This is the so-called TCTI, TPM, Command Transmission Interface, TCG, Abbreviations are always interesting, uh, <laughs> but that's probably a part of every standardization or organization. But it's a really cool feature um, that it definitely separates your transport layer from the upper API layers. And you can even stack these TCTI layers on top of each other, so whether you're talking to the access broker or directly to the, to, to the device, you can stack these on top of each other. And then at the upper layer, we see here three APIs or API levels as specified by the TCG. On the left hand side, we have the system API, which is really an expert layer, um, which is really only a mapping of, or one to one mapping of TPM commands to TSS commands. So if you want to do a TPM2 get random, yeah, you call a TSS 
underscore sys underscore get random. So that's all it provides there. So it, it, it allows you to call TPM functionality for, for, from a C wrapper, but apart from that, it really does not do that much more. It does some housekeeping, but generally it's really an expert level um, API, but you have to have it uh, in order to enable certain use cases. It's not dependent on any crypto, so if you want to do some HMAC uh, session authentic authentication, you have to do it yourself, which is, of course, painful. But if you don't have a crypto library, you might be glad. On top of that, there's the Enhanced System API, which, as the name says, enhances the System API. It provides some comfort wrapper around it. It helps you to, to, to automatically encrypt, have your sessions encrypted. It keeps track of your sessions. Um, you can easily exchange the TCTIs and all this stuff. But of course, there you start to have some malloc calls because uh, it allocates some memory for you. You have the dependency on the crypto library. So it gets a little bit more heavier. And on the right hand side, the gray box, gray because it's not yet ready, is the FAP. F stands here not for future, but rather for feature. <laughs> um, but it's still not ready yet. Um, the TCG is currently in the process of standardizing um, this uh, API level, which is a really high ab abstraction layer. So, so if, my TP, if my use case in SAP is like three pages long, it's one page in SAP, and in FAP it would be like three lines. So that, that's the, the level you get there. But of course, it's not yet, yet, uh, ready yet, so I think maybe in about one year there will be some implementations or at least first drafts available. And as I said, this is the, this is the problem if you're working with, with a standardization body. You cannot simply implement something and say, hey, this is, this is, this is, it, this is it, but rather you have to wait and work on the specification first in order to implement your code. It's a little bit tricky there, but yeah, we will get there eventually, and when, once we have Feature API, I think it will be um, quite cool. If you Google for Feature API, you will find a document, you will find a draft document, I guess, from 2014, but I would not recommend reading it because it is definitely stale and super outdated. It will not bear any resemblance to the final Feature API specification. So that's a word of warning. Yeah. How did we implement that? Um, so we have the system API, again, expert level thing, one-to-one -one mapping of TPM commands. We use for this uh, so-called libtss sys, sys for system API, creative naming there, um, which more or less translates the C types to TPM commands and backwards. So it's really, really easy. Um, you can use that on microcontrollers. We at Infineon have examples available for our Oryx and XMC microcontrollers. Uh, if you want to fit that on Arduino, you can actually do that. We did that as a proof of concept. So the TSS can work on, can work on an Arduino microcontroller, which is a really, really, uh, really, really constrained environment because we have a few megabytes and not really much horsepower there. But you can attach a TPM to an Arduino if you want. <laughs> in order to, to, to talk to the TPM, um, we also have the type marshalling layer. Um, therefore, you have to know that the TPM sends more or less compressed or marshaled data over the, the, the wire. So, so in order to save some bytes here and there, um, they compress data structures and send it in a more or less compressed form over the wire. For, for much simpler use, we have that libtssmu, MU stands for marshalling, unmarshalling, um, which translates these compressed data back into consumable C data structures. Then the, the enhanced system API, which was added in about uh, April this year. It's one of the bigger contributions, contributions to the TSS stack. In our case, it, as you can see, I don't know. Uh, um, it builds on, to on top of our sys layer and the TPMMU. The TPM de does not mandate that you are reusing your own code, but of course it makes sense to reuse lower layers, otherwise you would simply just reinvent the wheel. It also exposes all the TPM functionality, so 
nothing much change there. But the big, but the, but the big change there is that it takes care of your sessions and the encryption of the sessions. And this is really, really helpful because you don't have to write a lot of boilerplate code again and again and again and again for each command. You simply say, I want to have that command, open up a session first, and then you, you, you just pass in a session, session handle for the rest of, of, of your application and the session is carried over from command to command. And the ses sessions are encrypted, so you can have, or yeah, there you are actually protected against the TPM Jenny stuff. So that's quite good there. But of course, again, as I said, you have to have a crypto library. Some crypto libraries have SANE interfaces, some don't have a SANE interface, so it's a really, really interesting topic to have, to have the crypto library de de dependency there. And yeah, I'm really proud to say that this, was, this work was actually sponsored by, by my company and carried out by Fraunhofer. Fraunhofer is a research um, uh, organization in Germany. Uh, they had their own TSS implementation already ready, their own proprietary, and we, to we together with Intel, talked, talked to them and said, what can we do to open up your ESAP implementation and base it onto the Intel stack? And they said, yeah, pay us some money. So we did. And with that addition of the ESAP, um, more or less the, 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 the usability of the TSS stack as we know it began. Because with the SAP, it's really a pain to write applications. I think uh, Joshua can, can, can comment on that. Um, with the ESAP, it gets really okay. It's not, not super easy, you still have to know a lot about the TPM, but it gets to a level where, where me intermediate developer can do some really good stuff within a short amount of time. So this was also greeted by, by Intel and the open source community quite a lot that we added that ESAP layer, because if you want, currently want to write an, uh, a TPM aware application, please have a look at the libtss ESIS. Not below, unless you are into paint. <laughs> um, so yeah, and with the addition of the of the of the, of the Fraunhofer stack, um, we also mm, the whole community thing started to kick off. But I will come to that later. So um, <clears throat> yeah, the the one of the lower level one of the lower layer pieces of the stack is the TCTI implementation, which is the, uh, effectively the IPC or transport layer. Um, and it's nice that it's abstracted out in the spec because it means that uh, you can support TPMs that are remote devices, simulators, um, and that's all abstracted away uh, in your implementation. It's fairly, um, I think in open source circles, it's fairly standard that we have uh, decent um, abstractions at different layers of the system, but in some um, more proprietary uh, stacks, that's not necessarily um, the way they're designed, so the spec sort of encourages that implementation, which is always good. Uh, we've got a reasonable amount of TCT implementations in the um, in our TSS stack nowadays. Uh, we can talk straight to the device. We've got we can talk to our um, access broker and resource manager. Um, we've just had a contribution to add support for Windows TBS, which um, amazed me how easy it was to add that to our stack, which is uh, sort of really a a complement to the way the specs designed and the way the, the software stack has been implemented thus far. Um, Facebook came along and dropped like a 650 line patch on the project and now we can build our st a stack that was designed for Linux on Windows and use it against the TBS which is um, approximately equivalent to our resource manager and access broker daemon. Um, so that's, that's really great. Uh, we've also got a TCTI that's just being developed by Philip, who's been mentioned a few times, um, so that you can use the SAPI from uh, inside a UEFI application. So uh, the UEFI spec has um, some TPM uh, functions. I think it's got like three, uh, three or four ABI functions for interacting with the TPM, but it's <coughs> fairly restricted. So this. Um, this new TCTI enables you to use the full uh, TSS inside UEF UEFI, um, and it's probably one of the best use cases for something like the SAPI rather than using the eSAPI, which Peter was just talking about. Um, so just on the topic of uh, resource management, um, as, we've, as has been mentioned a few times, the TPM is uh, very resource constrained. It's small, it's got relatively little RAM, it doesn't have much um, space for uh, non-volatile storage. So there's 
um, a requirement to do resource management, and the specification has these three uh, functions for uh, loading, saving, and flushing objects from the TPM. Um, we have a user space implementation of a resource manager that can handle these tasks, um, but we are working with the kernel community uh, to push more of that into the kernel proper so that we do uh, resource management in the kernel. But the, the additional thing that this daemon adds, which is part of the specification, is that it does um, access brokering. So um, TPM has absolutely no notion of users or uh, isolation of um, you know, the, the objects that you're storing in the TPM. Uh, so this specification is for part of the software stack to uh, implement um, you know, some of the uh, protections that we uh, sort of expect in a standard, um, more secure operating system environment. Um, so I don't, uh, yeah, that, that's probably always gonna require a user space component, but the resource management's moving into the kernel. So if you've got a recent, uh, I think it's like 414 maybe kernel, then you get, uh, you can, you don't need the, you no longer need this um, daemon component, this user space component, if you only want the resource management aspects, which is uh, pretty good for some of the more lightweight use cases. Um, for a general purpose operating system, Linux desktop, then you probably want to have the user space daemon uh, because it, it introduces the access brokering, uh, but otherwise um, pushing more resource management into the kernel. Yeah. <coughs> So let's have a look at how we got here, um, because, uh, yeah. When I first looked at the TSS project back then, referred to as the Intel TSS stack, um, it was a mess. And I talked to Philip, um, who then picked it up. We, uh, I met him at one of the conferences here. He was sitting in the, in, in the, in the edge of the room, and he, he um, um, told a little bit about his project and how he came about to it. Um, more or less, all the other Intel, all the other former maintainers of the stack left Intel at the same time, so there was nobody to ask, nobody to care. And yeah, one of his bosses came up to him and said, "Do you do you need a new 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 task?" And he said, "Yeah, choose one." He said, eh, "That TSS stack looks nice." Then his boss asked him, "Do you really want to have a look at that?" And he said, "Yeah, I like it." So uh, yeah, so. He really describes this as a really messy situation back then, and it actually was. Um, if you look at the, the, the first commits back then, um, the implementation was not structured, it was not maintainable, it was really crappy to say. Not to blame, but yeah, it, it, it's, 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 it was not, not high quality. Um, it was a single uh, makefile based uh, project, so portability was really an issue. There were a lot of stuff in there that um, was simply not maintainable, and this were the first tasks um, um, Phil took up on. So he started to, 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 to make it debuggable, to add some debug statements, to add a logging framework, to use the right tools. Um, he chose for outer tools to do the configuring and all the stuff, so a little bit more of portability, and also for packet, ma packet management, to get it into a maintainable shape. Of course, there were still um, a lot of places in the code where he said, I would not touch this with a 10-foot pole. So his decision was to simply remove it and say, okay, this is code I cannot maintain, I have to delete it and rewrite it. A big, a big part there was the resource management daemon. So if you look at the previous implementation, there also used to be a resource management daemon, but he simply deleted it and said, I will not touch that, that's fundamentally broken, uh, I will re rewrite that from scratch. And funny, funny wise, it actually got him more or less into trouble at Intel because people were actually using that quite limited uh, resource management daemon, but in the end, he figured it out and got this new project working. So really, the first thing, if you want to, and here's the word of advice to other projects, if you want to turn your product or prototype or whatever you have into a real valuable and, and vibrating open source project, make it maintainable, make it debuggable, make it usable, and make it packageable. Make it easy to contribute, which Make is something Make it easy Phil to contribute, really yeah. Uh, so, yeah, this is exactly what he did, because he, with the auto tools things, and writing some wrapper scripts, and make it bundling, and doing correct shared libraries, and all this stuff, um, the project is now more or less 
ready for pickup by distributions. It's easy to pack a st standard auto tools uh, based package format and have some, ri uh, some wrappers around it and, and within a few minutes you have your distro package ready, which is quite good. <laughs> also, um, we are using the sem semantic versioning scheme, so every major number stands for an API break, which we had recently with the 2.0 release. So yes, um, make it clear what your version number rings are referring to what they are expressing. With the semantic versioning scheme, we really can recommend that. That really helps the distributions to pick up your stuff and f figure out whether there are into any dependencies you are going to break with a new version. Also, um, when Philip took over the product, uh, project, um, the testing was also a mess. No surprise here. Um, it was a 3,000 line single executable which had a lot of test cases intermingled with each other, interdependent on each other. So if you want to change one of the test cases, it, everything broke. So it was not maintainable and especially nobody else did or was able to add any tests to it. So yes, um, it was a large job to convert all these single tests which were interdependent on each other into a real test framework where you have separate test cases who run independent of each other. We also added unit tests there with Zimoka. Phil is a huge fan of it. Uh, he, uh, he said I should uh, adv advocate for it because he is a real fan. It's, there's a learning curve, but once you master it, it's, it's a really nice addition there. And for the integration tests, um, we run it on CI, so, so um, every build or every commit is run against simulator um, using the Travis CI, so every build is checked against the simulator. Um, we have coverall support, uh, so we have, we have a really nice code coverage, so modern open source systems or open source projects are all, all about badges and, and <laughs> statistics and all this stuff, and yeah. If you add a coverall thing to your batch, uh, to, to, to your readme MD, um, it gives the users and the distributors uh, quite some confidentiality of, of how major your, your, your software is. We have a code coverage rating currently about over 85%, which is quite good for an open source system, I think so. Um, we have coverity, um, static analysis checking, we have scan build uh, static analysis checking, so we, we are doing all the high level quality measurements which we, which we need or which we demand from, from, from such a base technology because if the stack would be flawed in some, some way, it would be a, a threat. So we are really pushing forward um, to have here high quality. And this is, if, if you're turning your own product into an open source project, uh, this is something where you should go to, to make it really uh, maintainable and build some confidence with your users. Yeah, and that's how we got it also up and running, and that's also where you can find our stuff. Ooh. <laughs> we have to hurry up a little bit, sorry. Uh, yeah, we are on GitHub in the vendor-neutral name TPM2 software. So it's not the Intel stack anymore, it's not the Infineon stack, it's not the Fraunhofer stack, but it's really the open source TPM TSS2 software. We have to come up with a nice name, <laughs> definitely. So, so go there, check it out. We have a lot of projects there. Um, one of the latest additions was the PKCSS 11 um, engine, which is still beta and don't use it for production, but please have a look at it. And if you want to contrib contribute, we are more than happy uh, for contrib contributions. And you can really see that the community is not made up only by two companies. We have maintainers from Intel, Fraunhofer, and Red Hat, and a lot of contributions from Infineon, Facebook, Alibaba, GE, Red Hat, SUSE, Deben. A lot of name dropping there, but it shows it's not a single developer thing there. It is really a community effort, what we are building there. And this is what my open source makes up. And even having two different companies standing here and giving a joint presentation, I think, um, shows the, 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 the value we see in that project. So, um, yeah, just get this. <laughs> just quick, um, uh, we're seeing increasing downstream adoption in distributions, which is really good. So, there's like the groundwork has been laid so that we can start to um, rely on this more in um, downstream software projects. Um, we just had a, um, in um, June, we had a major release to 2.0, added compatibility with a um, recent TPM spec 
Um, it added the ESAP implementation, which has made uh, working with the stack a lot more, um, uh, a lot easier, effectively. And um, our 2.1 release in October uh, added the, the Windows support, which I mentioned. So we've got Windows CI now. So we, we build our entire stack on Windows as well as Linux every time we have a commit, and we see uh, if there's any breakage. Um, and the Windows change is relatively minimal. It's really nice, uh, um, sort of. Um, impression of the stack effectively it demonstrates that we're doing the right things, I think. Um, so uh, I think briefly um, talk about use cases and examples. So we, we're seeing, um, we see quite a lot of times people build the stack and then they don't really know where to start. The TPM is great. It's a very versatile um, bit of kit, but it's also quite a large abstract um, set of security primitives that it provides. People don't always know what to do once they've started. So we, um, we looked at the core functionalities, what our TPM is good at, and we decided that the cryptography operations are something that we could help people um, sort of explore the TPM with a bit more. Um, there are things that a lot of software projects rely on already, whereas the attestation is um, a lot more abstract, especially in the open source domain. Um, <clears throat> so we have uh, a TPM2 tools project, which are effectively command line tools that enable you to interact with the TPM software stack without having to write a bunch of code first. Um, we've got fairly close to a one-to-one -one mapping to the TPM2 commands implemented as uh, ex executable um, Unix programs. Um, so we can, they're a really powerful tool for education and for prototyping. So you can um, string, it, string together a bunch of uh, TPM2 tools uh, and prototype a TPM workflow. Um, and if you dial up the verbosity of the tools, it will also spit out all of the commands that it's sending to the TPM and receiving back, which is also really useful uh, in terms of education and um, prototyping. Uh, we've, we've got a major release that we're working on right now where we've switched over to the new enhanced system API. Um, and it's going to enable us to more readily implement some desirable features. Um, we're also focusing quite a bit on improving the ease of use because these are an educational and prototyping tool. So we're looking at same defaults. We're looking at unifying uh, short options. So instead of, you know, dash C meaning one thing in one tool and a different thing in another, we're trying to make it mean the same thing in each tool. Um, we also have the ability to import and export objects in standard formats. Um, so here's a little example that I'm not going to step through just because we seem to be running out of time. But um, David A. Um, from Facebook gave a talk at Fosdem in 2017 where he demonstrated the latest state of the tools. Um, and he had like an 11 line example where he was um, taking the TPM data structures that we were writing out to disk and using DD to extract the parts that he needed to uh, compose a PEM file and stuff. Um, and there were lots of options required because none of the defaults, uh, there were no defaults effectively. Every option that the command exposed, you had to define a value for. Uh, so in the, in the next release, we've, um, we've tightened things up a bit. So it's uh, seven commands instead of 11 to replicate that example. I'm using full long option names instead of short option names because I have to use fewer options. So it still fits on the slide. Um, and I think we've made good progress and I think it's probably worth um, checking out um, so we have this uh, uh, an open SSL engine that we've um, just started working on. Really, um, it um, provides uh, RSA decryptions, RSA signatures, ECD, ECDSA signatures, um, and it's um, really going to be once it becomes a little bit more stable and useful. It's really going to be really nice to see distros ship that and be able to start using TPM out of the box. Um, so um, I, I've replicated the same example uh, from the tools with the OpenSSL engine. So you can see that um, we can do effectively the same thing in five steps. Um, and what, what we're doing in both cases, I probably should have mentioned, is that um, we are um, signing, uh, well, we're, we're hashing uh, something with a certificate in the TPM and then verifying that it's uh, valid with OpenSSL. So it demonstrates the interoperability of the components. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, another new thing Peter, Peter yeah. just mentioned. Yeah, this is our latest addition to the family, so to say. It's the PKCS11 uh, <laughs> provider uh, based on the work by Ivan Timmer. So we took that and 
developed it further with his permission. Um, current data is beta, 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 beta. It has a, still a lot of bugs, but it basically works with OpenSSL and P11 kits. So you can use it, but not for production, please. And if you can try and use it and tell us which of your use cases don't work, that would be great. Yeah, so any help wanted, please, please check it out and submit your patches. We are more than welcoming patches there. And I think we're gonna have to wrap up there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Maybe the last thing there, um, uh, there are a lot of projects already using our stack there. Um, maybe the, f the thing that's most interesting is the crypt setup blocks thing where we're currently also working on to get the full disk encryption ready for, for, for production use. So you can actually have that bit local use case you have on Windows and a Linux system as well. We're still working on that. Also StrongSwan as one of the, 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 the leading IPsec uh, or VPN client things there and OpenConnect us using our stuff. So this comes to our last slide. <laughs> yeah, or last but one. Well, there's a, yeah, so a, a little bit of detail about working with the stack, but mostly, uh, you know, we'd like some help. If you've got downstream projects that you think could make use of the VPN, uh, the TPM, come and talk to us. And uh, these are some areas that we think it would be useful, really uh, valuable to add TPM support. So the list is not inclusive. So you can add your product here and Come talk to us. So let's thank the speakers.